2014, we were looking at the Baldwin in God We Trust that you successfully challenged. I uh, wanted to get some details on that. Um, so from the state of Missouri, from your perspective, uh, could you describe kind of what the level of influence Christianity has on state policy and small towns? Um, well, in Missouri, and I would say across the Bible Belt and the South, it is involved in all manner of politics. Uh, some might even say insidious, insidiously. Um, we have it everywhere. We have, you know, um, In God We Trust, plastered in many, many city halls um, on taxpayer-owned property. But those influences, yes, they are coming from the loudest uh, contingency within these small towns who are evangelically Christian and all of their laws and everything is evangelically motivated. Um, they believe, as far as I understand, that God's law supersedes constitutional law. So I have a very strong feeling that as long as this is the thought process, you know, we will continue to see these pushes for God into our government because ultimately in their mind, it's God's law that should actually be in charge. So yes, prayer in schools, you know, we're still having battles over that. Um, so, you know, it's, it's everywhere and it's in everything. It's in, you walk into a bank in, in Missouri and, you know, there will possibly be a picture of Jesus and, you know, some scripture. Um, it's in all of our hospitals. Uh, we have very few hospitals that aren't extremely religiously motivated and structured. Um, so, yes, that's, they, they want not just a say in politics, but a religious influence. Okay. Now, in the case of um, A God We Trust, given that's the national motto, does that give that any credibility as to why they might want to put that up there? Well, yes. Unfortunately, it, it does. Because with this phrase on our currency, um, they can argue tradition and hold firm to that. Um, in fact, there are I believe right now that's one of the arguments they're using to get this in schools, whether it was Florida, North Carolina, somewhere recently, you know, we've got a, a really big push for In God We Trust and prayer in school. And once again, you know, that's, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> Try it again. National motto. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah. So the motto does have uh, a lot of influence in this sphere. It's, it's going to continually be used, you know, as a traditional sort of argument for backup. And as long as it exists on our currency, I think they, you know, whether we like it or not, that does give them a leg to stand on. It does give the evangelicals something to point to. Um, so as much as I, you know, would stand up and oppose prayer in school, I would stand up and oppose any new in God we trust signs at City Hall or where have you, I think I would be more focused on this being on the currency and, you know, removing that sort of blockade to everything else. And I think if we could take care of the currency, then we're going to see this being dealt with in City Hall more constructively, in schools more constructively, you know. So as long as that's their go-to argument, then... You know, and, and most folks still don't even want to discuss that the Pledge of Allegiance was altered during the Cold War, and there was no God in that. So, you know, there's been a steady plan to inject this into our schools. And in God We Trust, America, Inc. was, you know, it's, it's one of the organizations that's sort of pushing this, let's get God in government, let's get God in schools. And I believe they're in... Um, Bakersfield, California. So, okay. yeah, that's a good group to watch. <laughs> so, um, obviously, there's an concerted effort to push this agenda. Oh yes. Um, are you working with any group as part of the counter, or is this? Um, well, for me, it's somewhat personal. I'm happy to throw in, you know, resources with any group that is, you know, working towards this. We have E Pluribus Unum, um, the original motto project, and they've. They've made this their, you know, 
call to order and, and they're really going after it. Um, so I know they could use more support. Um, Michael Newdow is the attorney that I believe is addressing the In God We Trust on Currency issue. I want to say in the Eighth Circuit Court, but I'm not positive, but I'm pretty sure. So I know that he could use a lot more muscle um, with that because we're all sort of trying to catch up with all of the In God We Trust at prayer at school going around everywhere. But with, with Newdow's case, that could set some really amazing precedents that we could move forward with with much more ammunition ourselves. Okay. Um, just out of curiosity, how did you first learn that this was a move in your neighborhood? Um, well, in 2014, I, funny enough, I was reading um, the blog by Himot Meta, the friendly atheist. And that was where I first noticed it. And wow, it was my town. And it was kind of interesting to find this out, you know, from, you know, a, a resource that was not local and, you know, certainly sort of off the beaten path. And I pursued it from there and I went down to City Hall and gave a little speech to my council members and on public record. And they were receptive to that to some extent, obviously. Well, at least in Baldwin, everybody gets to have their say. Um, as far as I can recall, there were no you know, strictures on non-residents exercising their right to free speech. Um, so no, they, they seemed to allow me my time and my say and thanked me and didn't really have much else to say about it at that time. The vote was going to be two weeks later, so. Okay, well, outside of being um, perceived as like distasteful by some, what real threat do you think that having Ngawi Trust on publicly owned property presents? Well, this enforces a monotheistic view, you know. Um, it's not incorporating the all of the citizen, citizenry that might make up, you know, your city. And the problem becomes the people who feel threatened by this are typically the folks that aren't going to speak up. Um, and they're threatened because they're non-Christian, and that could be you know, anything. It could be atheist. It could be agnostic. It could be Buddhist. It could, you know, any non-Christian can feel targeted and threatened by having this in their city government, whether it was paid for by their tax dollars or not. This is obviously an endorsement of a monotheistic God by city officials. <clears throat> and in light of that, you know, any non-Christian might not feel that they are going to get due process in that arena, that there is already bias existing. Um, and that's also another way to keep people silent. Once again, those who are, are in fear and feel threatened typically won't be the people who go on record. I don't give a shit. Pure and simple. You know, I don't like it and I think it's wrong and I don't think it should be up there. But does it threaten me personally? No, because I live out loud. There's people who cannot. You know, um, and Baldwin, I was contacted by, you know, LGBT citizens, you know, um, who were also atheists. And so, you know, now we've compounded things and, you know, they might not have been white on top of all this, you know. And so for them coming out in a white Christian community as, say, a physician who is a black gay man, atheist, like, wow, you know, this guy's really drawn some attention to himself here. And, you know, that could interrupt his work, you know, and cause problems. And so, yeah, there, there are people who are strong people, but if they come out, they're risking everything. You know, even in a small town like Baldwin, it's, you know, I think we, we decided it was, what, some 60,000 living there, if not more by now. And so that allows for a very diverse crowd. Yes, Christians are the majority and they make sure everybody knows that. And any sort of self-defense, you know, like stop beating me with your Bibles is persecuting my neighbors. When we say, please don't, we're, you know, now we're the bad guy for <laughs> requesting equality and equity, you know, under the eyes of the law and not their Lord. When you were actually at City Hall and making your case, afterwards, what kind of reception did you have among the other attendees? 
Oh, well, the first time I made my case at City Hall, um, I did so because there was no one else there that seemed to be going on record about it. The City Hall business that night was actually absolutely non-related. There was no discussion of God, we, of in God we trust on the schedule. But, you know, I knew they were going to be voting. And so I wanted to hang out and see, if, you know, if anybody was going to be speaking on it. And I arrived and there was maybe four people there total, including myself. Um, and aside from my two children who were in tow. So, you know, I, I went ahead and signed up and went on record. And after I gave my speech, um, there was one gentleman in the crowd who was upset by it. And so he then decided to get up and speak why he was in favor of it. Um, but I don't think he was originally there to speak to that. I think he just was sort of a city hall groupie and, you know, regularly, regularly attended their meetings. So, um, and no, there was initially no response, really. You know, I said my thing, he said his thing. They went on about business, you know, and everybody went home. And so it was actually Hemant Mehta who um, my son had videoed my speech so that, you know, I could critique myself. So I'm no public speaker, not really. And, you know, I knew I would be going back in two weeks. And I wanted, you know, someone who understood this maybe better than I did to look at my impromptu speech, make some recommendations, you know, and see where we should go, you know, two weeks later and how will we, how will we accomplish this? And so I did, I sent the video footage to him on Meta and, you know, sort of requested his critiques and he replied back, he would like to run it in his blog. And I really kind of had to think about that because, you know, it's, it's fallen, <laughs> it's Missouri. And I'd already gone on public record, but, you know, was that's now going to be a kerfluffle. And well, what sort of trouble am I inviting into my own personal life or my business um, by standing up and speaking out and then having it, you know, go out to a larger audience than just my immediate ball in area. So I really had to consider my family and my children. I knew it would possibly, you know, it would make it difficult for them in school. Um, and it did. <laughs> Eventually it did. Um, so yeah, that's, that answers your question. <laughs> what, what kind of repercussions did they face at school? If you don't well, know? just, you know, your mom, is that your mom? You know, um, mostly it was, I believe the, the teachers knew. And from what I understood, the teachers were fairly well split on the issue, um, but it was the Rockwood PTO that decided I was Satan herself and taking God away from their children. And um, I, I had heard they were going to show up at the second meeting in force. And I don't know what happened to them. <laughs> I responded, it will be great to see you then and there. And they did not come. Um, but I did also question publicly whether was, were, was the Rockwood PTO speaking up on behalf of Rockwood in a city of Baldwin issue relating to religion and was Rockwood comfortable with their PTO having that sort of voice for the entire Rockwood parent community? And they really don't, you know. Uh, the, the PTO members, I would assume, would be free to speak on their own behalf as citizens and in, as its residents, but I can't imagine Rockwood School District, you know, coming down on sort of publicly either side of the issue at this point and into a city hall setting. So as far as I know, the PTO didn't show up, at least not in mass. I believe there were a couple of Rockwood PTO ladies there shooting daggers at me with their eyeballs, but. Well, I'm glad to see they missed, <laughs> mostly. <laughs> the scar is concealed. Um, so you mentioned you, you publicly challenged some of these, like what outlets, you, you're talking like Facebook groups, pages, op-eds, how, how did I you I publicly challenged what specifically? Well, like either the PTO or trying to put your position out oh, on the event. Yes, yes. And you know, they're public pages, just sort of across social media, you know, it was here mm -hmm. and there. 
mostly when people brought it to my attention because we were working really hard on organizing our resources and getting everybody's input so that round two, I could take what my actual resident friends and you know new people I had met through this process that could not stand up um, you know, and speak for them. So I wasn't going to speak on behalf of others without actually including their input in the round two speech. So, okay. yeah, we were busy. <laughs> there was a lot of that background noise, but there's sort of always going to be. And I saw no reason. <clears throat> I suppose we could have really gotten into it with Rockwood PTO, but I don't see sort of instigating as for the sake of instigation itself as productive. And I would rather have fought them at City Hall more so than little bickering on the social media, which is just... Right. So out of curiosity, when you um, first presented at the first meeting, mm -hmm. was there any discussion or question from the city council? Not very much. It's just, thank you. Thank you for going on record. You may sit down now. <laughs> Please sit down. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. Um, not, no, nothing direct from them. Um, I did get a sort of nice email from um, my city alderman, who was now my state rep at the time, or at the time he was city alderman. Now he's my state rep, and that was nice. Um, it was it was supportive in context of. I would say very nonpartisan manner. Okay. You know, so that was that was nice. Good. Usually you don't hear back. <laughs> so did you see like any kind of change in attitude from the council, like from the first time versus the second time that you presented? The second time there were a few members who were quite obviously displeased. <laughs> um, excuse me, and I don't think they were really interested in in having the debate, and they wish it had never happened. Um, one of them even lamented at the second meeting that this was the fullest city hall had ever been and the largest fallen city hall meeting in history. So yeah, they, they didn't really seem gung-ho by the second round. So that's unfortunate for them. Okay. Um, as far as like anybody else who might be facing this type of motion in their particular cities, state. Um, right. Do you have any advice as to how they should best go about either monitoring or responding, contracting uh, for resources? Sure, absolutely. I would put up uh, Google Alerts. If you don't know how to do that, you can search. It's pretty easy to figure out. Google it. Yep, <laughs> Google it. Google, Google Alerts. And you can set up whatever sort of phrase you're interested in receiving daily alerts on. So, for instance, if you're in Missouri, you would put in a Google alert for In God We Trust Missouri. You can try and get more specific your town, but typically, you know, Missouri should cover all the cities. And it'd be nice to know if there's a sister city or, you know, wherever, so you can alert your, your other neighbors. Um, so that's one way. Um, and I would say, yes, it's very, very important for residents to go speak at these, you know, city halls um, on this issue. Uh, I would say that business persons with businesses in that city, if you don't live there, you should absolutely go speak uh, because they might be turning business away from your city. Um, for instance, right now there's a fight in Winsville. Uh, so there might be people who will have fear now of, of going to Winsville because of how voraciously they have fought this fight, you know. Um, and yeah, that can absolutely affect their, their commerce and that seems to be something that Winsville isn't taking into consideration. Uh, the, that land out there is going to, as St. Louis continues to expand west, that, that land will be worth, you know, more money tomorrow than it is today but not if they are taking a sort of hard religious line so publicly, that's, that's a major turnoff, you know, even for Christians that I know, find that is a major turnoff as well. So I don't think they realize that outside of Wentzville, there are, you know, secular minded Christians. 
uh, a lot of folks seem to think that secular means atheist and it does not. <laughs> You know, secularism and government means that we respect the boundaries that our forefathers laid before us. Um, and that means freedom of and from religion as well. So we have to keep all that separate. We have to keep it out of government. We have to keep it out of schools. And they had a very good reason for, for wanting it that way. So I think it's easy to live in Winsville and think that, you know, we are the Christians and we're the majority here and we say what goes. And what they don't realize is, there is an entire movement of Christians who are for secularism in government. And that's the, you know, United, uh, what's the name of that outfit? Americans United for Separation of Church and State. Um, and that is comprised of many, you know, different religions. But, you know, primarily this is a Christian organization. And they are very, very into keeping, you know, God and government separate. So, you know, I would... I would say, yes, get up there and say something. Um, if it's residents and business owners, it's going to be much more powerful. If you wait until the sign is up, it's not going to come down. And it's, it's not going to come down with a lot of money, time, and effort spent into this. Um, so in my opinion, it's better to focus on them before they go up. Set your Google alerts. And you should, you know, if it's happening around you, you should find out, show your ass up, go on the record, um, you know, and encourage the residents and business owners to do so as well. But as far as turning anything into a full scale launch against a sign that's already up um, and spending a lot of time, money and effort there, I think that might be, you know, somewhat futile. Um, definitely speak up always speak up, but know where to go to fight those battles. And I would say go to chop off the head of the snake and not all these little <laughs> tentacles hanging out. And the head of the snake is that it's on our currency and has no business being there. Okay. And last question um, that I can think of is if you had somebody who was sensitive to kind of any kind of backlash, mm -hmm. um, are there any groups that advocate or any oh certainly there would be um freedom from religion foundation american atheists americans united for separation of church and state um they're actually you know a few aclu uh, so there's there are organizations out there who you know can back you up on that unfortunately we seem to have very little protections ourselves and so proving that you know, being fired or mistreatment at work was a result of your religious preferences, that being non or non-Christian. It's very, very hard to prove that that was the motivations of, you know, the, the perpetrator. So, you know, yes, you can still contact them and should, but know going in that those are very hard to prove and we need to figure out exactly how we can prove that and where are our religious protections where's our religious freedom of none or not yours we'd like them too <laughs> yes is there anything else you'd like to contribute or add or advice well i would say you know i get really perturbed by the hero's journey stories um and I've said it before and I'll say it again. I, I don't think I'm special. I don't think our win in Baldwin, which, you know, this sign hadn't been up yet. It was voted down six to two, which was pretty amazing. <laughs> you know, we didn't think we'd win, but we went after it anyway. And we went after it hard. You know, we came back two weeks later and in mass and, you know, made our statements. So, you know, I would say, this is something anybody can do. You don't have to be special to go down and go on record at your city hall. That's your right. And you should. <laughs> and you don't have to be an Ivy League educated person or a, you know, the speech debate club winner <laughs> from high school. You know, anybody can do it. And as much as I love the clinical arguments, um, I would say bring your passion, even if you think you're, especially if you think you're going to lose. And I don't, I don't necessarily have, an, have a problem 
with what others would call an emotional argument. Um, you can bring fair and valid points and bring those with passion. And I think you should. <laughs> you know, I think if you're pissed, you need to let them know you're pissed. Uh, there will be those that will tone police you. I'm angry. <laughs> you should be too. And if I get up there and I do not express my feelings along with my valid complaints and logical complaints, they're getting a monotone droll. They're not entreated into this, you know, so bring your heart, stand up there and throw it down. You know, and if they try to remove you before your time is up, I would probably go kicking and screaming and so should you, you know, so anybody that's that that's happened to, Definitely, you know, find an attorney and um, take care of that. You, you have free speech and you should exercise it. So, Sounds yeah. good. Well, thank you so much for your time. All right. Thank you. And uh, good luck fighting the fight. I'll keep fighting. <laughs> All right.